Welcome to the Poetic Resurrection Podcast, where we explore perceptions. How self-reflecting questions can give you a better understanding of self. I'm your host, Sonia Iris Lozada. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Poetic Resurrection. Today, we have a wonderful lady here, Jeanette Yoff. She is a psychotherapist, an author, and an actress, just like me. So welcome. How are you? I'm good, Sonia. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and just talk with you. For people out there, Jeanette and I were talking at one of our best friends party and I said, hey, you should be on my show. (laughs) (laughs) I said, Um, I'd love to. Yes. She's a psychotherapist who works with adoptees. Is that my saying that right? Yes. Adoptees, people who were adopted. Yes. And you have your therapy and you help a lot of children and adult adoptees. Do you want to tell me about that? And also, how, how did you get into acting? Sure. It was Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, it's all different pieces. So I actually in, let me go back. When I was adopted, because mm-hmm. I was also adopted at the age of seven and a half, we actually lived next door to a dance studio, right next door. Uh-huh. So I began dancing and I loved being on stage. And it wasn't until I, grew up that I learned only as an adult that my own birth mother was a dancer in Argentina, but no one told me that. And my adoptive family, they were somewhat artistic, creative. My mother was a fashion designer in Manhattan, my adoptive mother. However, she wasn't a performer, right? Being on Mm -hmm. stage and perform, like you have to like that and have that confidence and charisma. I always wanted to be on stage. So through high school, I auditioned for plays and started loving it because I loved being other people. And I'll speak to that because when you're adopted, there's a lot of invisible wounds. People can't see them, but us as adoptees feel them. And it's grief and loss. It's shame. It's feeling a lack of control and things that happened to you as a young child that you had no control over. So for me, acting became another way of coping. And in doing that, I actually went to Pace University in downtown uh, New York, Mm -hmm. received a degree in theater. And then I decided to move to Los Angeles. I started writing a one woman play called What's Your Name? Who's Your Daddy? about growing up in foster care and adoption. And I did it for a bunch of agencies in Los Angeles, benefits. And after the show, I would do a Q&A with the audience and found that there were therapists, social workers, parents, really wanting to understand the internal world of the child who's either been raised in foster care or even adopted right after birth. And here I was answering all these questions, like I was the expert. Well, you kind of are, (laughs) right? And then someone said, yeah, you kind of are because you (laughs) live this experience and now you wrote a full play. And I started thinking, wow, I think I really want to work with children. I've always loved working with children. And I learned in Los Angeles, there were 45,000 children in the foster care system at that Mm. time. This is 20 years ago. So it blew my mind. And I said, who better but me to work with kids and bring in the creative arts and help inspire a child and give them self-esteem and confidence that you're going to grow up and you're going to be okay because a lot of kids don't have that role modeling. And so that's what I chose to do. I went back to school, got my clinical psychology degree, and here I am, started a private practice, Yoff Therapy work with children, families, adults, birth parents, adopted parents, foster parents, all helping them understand this experience. And then I started a nonprofit called Celia Center, which is named after my first mother, Celia, 
And I wanted to create a community in Los Angeles to support us because I'm one person and we need a community. We need a that family of people supporting each other. So that's what I'm doing today. I have Yoff Therapy at Celia Center and now I've written a few children's books beyond my play. So I'm happy to be here and it's November National Adoption Month. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'm glad you told me it was the adoption month because it was perfect to have you on the show for November. Thank you. When did you meet your mom and why did you call your program Celia? Because I, I would think that, you know, some people would feel so hurt that they felt, you know, like the parent gave them up, but yet you named the program after her. Can you tell me what, what prompted you to do that? Yes, that's a good question. And I've had many people ask me this. Why didn't I just call it the Los Angeles Adoption Center, right? <laughs> to answer your question, why I called it Celia Center, I learned that my mother had mental health challenges. I don't like the word issues. I always say challenges because that implies something's wrong with you. And we need to erase the mental health stigma. There's nothing wrong with her. She had untreated post-traumatic stress disorder. She had an accident as a young child. And when I learned about her mental health issues and what was happening in her life at that time, that caused her to be compromised in her ability to parent. Now I'm a parent. Are you a parent? No. Parenting is hard work. You don't oh, realize how hard it is. I, oh, I realized <laughs> because my parents you know, I grew up poor. So, and I was the eldest. So guess what the eldest does? The eldest in Latin culture takes care of the young ones. Yes. Yeah. That's called parentified. You were parentified. You become is that a what parent. It is? It's yeah. a term in psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a lot of pressure for a child. Yes. It's called, can cause anxiety, depression. They go hand in hand. So when I learned about her struggles, I was less feeling abandoned. I was angry. I really was able to process and see this experience beyond my own narcissistic wound mm -hmm. and see her as a woman. She came to United States in the early 1970s to continue her career as a dancer. She had a dance company in Argentina. Mm -hmm. She's already been cited in three Latin American books about women in Argentina, in the arts, art exhibits, performing arts, and visual arts. And she's a part of that rich cultural community in Argentina. So I, I've really begun over the past 10 years only really learning about her life before she came to the United States. And when she came to the United States, she didn't speak the language. She was here on a work visa. This was the early 70s. She did party with some other artists. It was what you did in the back in the day at a place called Max's Kansas City. I went there. You did? I was a punk rocker in the 1980s. And I used to go to, um, when I was in New York, I went to Max's Kansas City and Salvador Dali was always downstairs with his wife having a meal. Yes. He hung out with the punk rockers. And I think it was Thursday nights, the Ramones were the house band. Ah, so they, yeah. played, unless they were on tour, they, they played at uh, Max's. There's Kansas so City. much history there. Mm -hmm. Artists, poets, beatniks, poets, just all musicians, models, all creative arts were there. Yeah. And so she loved the arts. She had me. She met my father. They got married. She's Roman Catholic. We need to get married. And she had significant mental health issues. And I was placed into the foster care system. She was also pregnant with my brother. I was with her while she was pregnant. And two months later, after I left her and went to a foster home in Long Island, because it was deemed unsafe for me to live with her, apparently she was compromise. She thought she was going to hurt me. She was scared she was going to hurt me. She was having delusional thoughts. She couldn't manage well because I also learned her mother was dying in Argentina. So here we have a woman, one child, me, and then another baby on the way. 
She doesn't speak the language. She doesn't have mental health support. Who's there supporting her with two children? She didn't know how to tap into the resources. And unfortunately, I don't think my birth father understood how to help her and felt victimized himself by the situation and helpless, hopeless, and powerless. So it just became this cycle of compromised parents who just couldn't parent any children born on our birthdays. So I went to the system. Then my brother was born. Nine months later, he went into the system. My mother had increased anxiety, which became psychosis. And then she was deported back to Argentina and lived in a government hospital, institutionalized uh, hospital for women for the next 20 years, 40 years wow. actually of her life. And so that's her whole life. Yes. Oh, yes. so there's a lot of compassion there. A lot, a lot of compassion. So for me, naming Celia Center, Celia Center reminds me where I come from mm -hmm. and the help and support that she needed not just her, any mother, adoptive parents, foster parents, all mothers need support. And if a family cannot stay together because the parent is not capable, whether it's due to schizophrenia, which was my mother's final diagnosis, mental health, mental illness, incarceration, drug and alcohol addiction, which is today's biggest reason why any child is in foster care, that we help support families and children know where they come from and can still be connected to their families because a lot of my work is reunion work mm -hmm. and open adoption work and open foster care. Even though you've been through foster care, children form attachments to their foster families and they want to see their foster families again. Like I, I still see my foster family and I'm an adult. Yeah. They're now, a part of me. But you were adopted as well, weren't you? Yes. At the seven same and people? a half. No. So I was with my birth family for 15 months and went into a foster home on Long Island, New York for the next six and a half years, and then went to another family when I was seven to be adopted. That was oh. a very trying time for me. Wow. Well, so young. So, yeah. So young. Yeah. It's like you, you, my, my adoptive father would say, you came to us at seven and you had a whole history we knew nothing about. You were like a full grown person. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Cause they say, aren't you like, you're like an, a sponge until you're five and then you start being creating your own after that. Or is the timeline correct? Is it five? Yeah. Children are absorbing their environment through their attachments. So they're highly impressionable. Children learn what they live. So yeah. whatever's happening around them, they're going to imitate and copy. That's what kids do. Yeah. And yes, the first five years are crucial for a child's development. So we want a lot of safety, security, stability for children. Not too many moves um, because it can cause attachment challenges. And Yeah, I would think that it's like, you're going to leave me anyway. So why should I get close to you? Yeah, so I work with a lot of kids that, you know, have been through a lot of homes and I love it. And I bring in the creative arts and we do role play and I make it fun for kids to take the shame out of it. I wrote two children's books. What is adoption and what is foster care? <laughs> and we read, we play because a lot of therapy that I do is play therapy. We act out things, you know, we, we go into our what's called the primal wound, which is where all the pain is. I have interventions where we get this black oak tag and we draw like this is our inner hidden world that we don't want to look at. And we put a flashlight on and we draw on there. You know, I, I get really involved with the kids to help them just process like, yeah, this is a part of, we have our shadow world, things that we're ashamed of and are hidden and that's typically for kids who've been through these early childhood adverse experiences. There's a lot going on in that shadow world that we want to bring into the light so they can have compassion and love and empathy for themselves to yeah. heal and move through the experience. And we're never fully healed. 
we're always continuously healing. It's a lifelong journey. Well, it is. And, you know, I could imagine because the average person has a, a shadow side. So add in the adoption or feelings of abandonment, that's just an extra to it. People with mental illness, it's not that they won't, they can't like other people. They're compromised emotionally, psychologically, cognitively. I mean, I was just talking to parents today on the phone, helping them understand their adoptee who's having mental health issues right now. Let's not judge. Let's step back. Mental health issues causes compromising situations for people. They can't, not that they won't, they can't behave like other people their age. And another phrase that I use, and then I'll stop, is what's hysterical right now, we must assume is historical. It's coming up because it needs attention. It's unfinished business, as we say. That So hysterical is historical. So I'll That's say, all right. One. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's think about that, right? Why is it so bad? I'm so upset. You know, enough is enough because it, it's there. It's raw. It's needing attention. And that's typically when I see kids and teens and adults in therapy. There's crisis because it's now coming to the surface. And so. the, the way life is, no matter how much you suppress it, it's going to come up to the surface. And I can un yeah. totally understand why drug is an alcohol, because for that minute that you're uninfluenced, the pain goes away. Right. But it's right. only a minute. That's you know, right. it, it's right. not going to go away for more than that. So I, yeah. I totally understand that. I want to know more about your journey. You gave us a good example of oh, okay. the going through the adoptee and stuff like that. What prompted you to write the solo show? Because it's uh, usually a beginning that says, yes, you got to do this. <laughs> yes, there was. So I had joined a theater company called Venice Theater Works in Venice Beach. And the executive director, who's now my husband, mm -hmm encouraged all the actors to write something. We want to be a group that creates original works. This is kind of what spawned it. My adoptive father, I'm talking to him on the phone and he says, you know, it's kind of like you auditioned for us. Now that you're an actress, it's so interesting. You, you always like audition for us. And I said, I did really? That's interesting. I remember singing Annie and just trying to impress everybody. Just get people to like me yeah. because I wanted to feel wanted and loved. Makes me tear up. And so, and that deeply is any child who's been separated from their family has this narcissistic wound. Just, I want to be loved and wanted. And it's hard for us to really express that because we're so scared of being abandoned and rejected again. And so I think I had a dream and I woke up the next day and I said, oh my goodness, I want to write a piece about a little girl who auditions for a family because that's what it did feel like. I was auditioning for them. Yeah. So I wrote this piece, it's bringing tears to my eyes and it was just, there was an auditioner who's like tough, you know, hey, okay, come on out, put your head shot down, okay. And you see this little girl who's like, hi, um, tell me what I got to do because I'll do anything that you ask me. And she's doing everything to impress the casting auditioner, director, right? the casting director. But we don't realize what she's actually doing until the end. And you see her like anyone would do the good ship lollipop dance. But then she starts saying, I tie my own shoelaces and I know how to cut my own hair. You see her saying things out of desperation. Mm -hmm. And then the auditioner, the casting director says, so tell me how much experience you've had. And she says, oh, I've had a lot of experience because I live in two families. And I've been in foster care for a really long time. So I know how to be a really good daughter. I know how to do that. And I think they're going to like me. So you see her so vulnerable. And as I'm acting this out for 
theater troupe, they're like, what is this? And I said, <laughs> well, it's kind of like my life. It's a reenactment of what it felt like. And dramatically, mm -hmm. the urgency, the, the need, the survival to be loved and be taken care of. And at the end of the piece, the casting director says, all right, I think we have enough to show the Kopitowski family. We'll let you know in a couple of weeks if they want to meet you and see you again, you know, meet you. And so you see this little girl like, okay, that she just auditioned for a family and the role is daughter. And it's really, it, it just hits you in that place where you're like, wow, okay. Now I understand not only if the 45,000 children in LA County, but there's a, right now, about a hundred and, I think the recent number was 133,000 children this Saturday is National Adoption Day, where across the country, children's courts open up and they process child's adoption from foster care this Saturday. So 133,000 children will have a family they belong to officially, that love, that belonging, a place to call home. So they're all, when I would go out and stage, I would envision all the kids right behind me and mm -hmm. I'm being their voice for us to help the world understand what it's like to be in foster care and want so deeply to be adopted. Yeah, to belong. To be, yeah, love. Yeah. Belong, exactly. I mean, I can't even imagine that kind of hurt because as an average person, that's something I wanted too. I think that's something everybody wants. So I can see if you didn't have it growing up or just, you know, it, the, the need would be so much more. Oh, yeah. Do you find that children need people to prove that they love them? Do you find that that is an issue or something that happens? So our self-esteem is compromised. Mm -hmm. We just feel unlovable, unwanted. So I'll tell parents, you can tell a child, you could say 300 times, you're good enough, you're valuable, you're worthy, but it goes in one ear and it goes out of shoot. We need more validation, more acknowledgement. Trust me, you're not gonna call, create a narcissist because we have a narcissistic wound. We need to be seen heard, received, acknowledged, validated of our worth and value. We don't believe it. It's until the thousandth time that a parent goes, I believe in you. I know you can do this. And my mom used to scream for me on the soccer field, I remember, and I'd be so embarrassed. But now, <laughs> now I'm like, hey, that's what I needed. She gave me what I needed. Someone screaming for me, you're good enough keep it up. Don't give up. So we do need someone to point out our value and worth more so. And Sonia, for you too, for people that did not receive what's called these good parenting messages. What do you mean by good parenting messages? So, cause I was I, like the parent. The yeah. one thing that I'm very, very lucky. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's a cultural thing because right. the oldest from the Latin group, it's, you know, that's the way it is. And, but the one thing that I never, ever questioned was how much my parents loved me. So and you I felt think, that, Oh, yeah, you felt that I don't, you know, I was afraid to be a parent myself because I wouldn't be as good as them. My mom was so loving. Granted, we were poor and, you know, we didn't know sometimes where our next meal will, would come from. Uh -huh. But that's the one thing that I knew I could count on, mm. you know? Yeah, that's and, security. Yeah, you the, had that. the love. I had the love. Didn't the have love. much security. because Oh, you did? We, we didn't know. We didn't have any money, you know? So I, you know. The security got, and the attachment. In the attachment, you had that. Knowing. I had that. I and you were able to internalize it. Right. Download it into your body. 
mm-hmm. kids who have that abruptly separated that I can't even imagine loss. Yeah. And it doesn't, ex- it feels like it doesn't exist anymore. So now I have to find it elsewhere. Where is that? And it's through people. I would think that when you're separating, you grieve and automatically you're with another family. You don't have enough time to really s- switch as to how you feel because you're grieving still. And now you got to start something new. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, that is so hard. I mean, I don't it think it's so hard. It's hard for me as an adult to be able to handle something like that. Exactly. You know, exactly. I think I'm more equipped for it, but it still would not be easy. Yeah. But I think the going into the arts has been, is a lifesaver yeah. for many people. You do the acting and you do that. I have another poet who goes into the jails and teaches them, you know, talks to the incarcerated and does all of this. And, you know, I'm a poet and so are you. We didn't say you were a poet. (laughs) (laughs) What gets repressed must be expressed. I I love it. Can you read us a poem? I would love to. Okay. I was thinking the... The shorter one. Okay. <laughs> the, cho- the Chosen Child. This was Ooh. one of my first poems that I wrote when I was 17. And it's from the book. What's Your Name? Who's Your Daddy? Is now in written form. I don't know yes. if you can see this. People oh, yes. get the book. If you have a chance, I'll put the information on the bottom. Thank you so much. And I recorded it on Audible. Oh, so perfect. Like, like, like a radio play. So you can listen to the whole story. It's 11 chapters. So in the back of the the printed play are some poems. So this is called The Chosen Child. I never was born. I am lost in a black hole, but magical. Being adopted is like arriving in a mystery movie five minutes late. At times I'm a helpless changeling at others, an omnipotent creature from another planet. I am not real, not connected, always in a fog, suffocated by emotional blankets. But I am strong. We are sole survivors of a world no one else has ever seen. I have decided to search. It is the moment of choosing myself. I will recreate myself. Lack of trust. I will never be bound to one identity. I will remain in a constant search. That's really beautiful. I could visualize it as you were reading it. And what is the name of that poem? The Chosen Child. The Chosen Child. Wow. I could, you know, as I'm visualizing it and seeing it's like they bring you in and everything, I would think that would be so fearful because you don't know them. And you don't know where you're at. You don't know how they're going to act with you. I'd be locked in my room for a couple of days. <laughs> it's scary. And when I, I was also a social worker for a little while. And when I would transition a child from one home to the other, I would literally stand at the front door, knock on the door. I go, we're going to, and I'd look at the child and go, we're going to take a full tour of your house. And I'm not going to leave until you feel comfortable. I'm taking this journey with you. We'd hold hands, walk into the house. And the parent would usually look at me like, she's the strangest social worker I've ever seen. But I said, (laughs) can you please show us everything? Like, where's our toothbrush? What happens when we wake up in the middle of the night? We're thirsty. Where do we get help for this? Who do we ask for this? So that, because what we're typically doing in the child welfare system is we just drop kids off, expect them to just, roll with it. Be resilient. Resilience comes from someone knowing you, supporting you, helping you through that transition so that you can tolerate the experience. I mean, we we tend to recreate more toxic stress for kids by not doing these necessary things that make sense, right? Right, because you could see if you just drop off a child where something can be conceived as misbehaving, it's just something of not knowing. For instance, you got to go to the bathroom, but you don't know where the bathroom is. And let's say you're a little kid and you pee in your bed. So now that's that's, that's something that's called misbehaving, but nobody showed him where the bathroom was. 
it's not. All behavior is a form of communication of an unmet need. And I talk all about this, Sonia, on my YouTube channel, which is yes. called <laughs> Genetically Speaking, J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E, Genetically -E, Speaking About Foster Care Adoption and Mental Health. And I have 10, 20 more videos I want to make. I don't have enough time. I do. I know I that. Do a... yeah, yeah, that's the thing, because with this podcast, I really said, I'm going to put the actual video up, but I need to edit it. And then I, I'm i like, I have not had to change. To do it. I know, it's a but lot I do want to do it is a lot of work I and you know like I am a one woman show so exactly. I do okay. the audio and um, but you know it's so interesting when I have people like you because I find it so important the creative arts in any type right. of mental health that's right any type of mental health me too the writing expressing out we need to externalize that internalized experience yeah. get it out side of you when you can get it outside of you, you can have a new perspective of it right and Visually, that's the thing yeah per perceptions and perspectives yeah when you see a person differently you see a different person same thing with experience when you see an experience differently you have a different experience right of it so. yeah because what's that if you take two people and they see the same thing and you ask them what they felt later, it's going to be two different stories. Exactly. It we all, all have our own perception. Everybody. Yeah. I mean, that's what this show is about. Exploring perceptions. Exactly. So I want to say one other thing is with Celia Center, when I realized, and I didn't know this till I was an adult, that she was so heavily involved in the arts. I then started a new program with Celia Center. Mm -hmm. called the Celia Center Arts Festival. And it's called Adopting Resilience, Fostering the Art of Creativity. And so, so far we've done three arts festivals. We're going to do another one in May, 2023. So anyone listening, please go to our website, celiacenter.org, sign up for our um, newsletter and you'll get uh, info about that. And it's going to be called Foster Care's Got Talent. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of talent because I really feel when it comes to acting, because I'm also an actor, is that you have to know what something feels like. And when you have really lived, and let's face it, these little kids have really lived. Right. I mean, it, you know, they have lived a lifetime of an adult and they're only five I or know. six. I you know. know, so know. what a better way to express than than to do that yeah and be celebrated that's, yeah. that's the piece celebrating that's what we're going to do with this event and you can be a kid you can be a teenager you can be an adult anyone who's experienced foster care that wants to perform something and we're going to have an art gallery so there could be artists visual arts and performers doing anything i will definitely so. love to do something like that make sure around the time i could do like a PSA type of thing. Oh, and thank you so much. Yeah. Because that, 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 see, I'm really into helping people with mental health. Yeah. You know, hopefully there's a shortcut because I'm a survivor. And I kept saying, you know, I always had this belief that, well, you learn from what happens to you. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what the heck I was supposed to learn from this. <laughs> right. But what I realized. What did you learn? Yes. I learned that I need to help others who have gone through the same thing. There you go. And just let them know that they're not damaged goods. They're actually right. special because yes. you have something to give now. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's. Yeah, you're enriched. Very enriched. You're, you've lived. And yes. instead of being angry, just think of how you could help so many others with what you've experienced. Exactly. That's the only thing I can think of, which with what I went through. And so that's amazing. Yeah. Your podcast. Yes. You're doing the same thing. You're writing. Yeah. yeah. Your poetry. poetry. And I've been writing poetry since I was a little kid. And it's funny. I look at some of the old poems I have. I'm a teenager because I lost all, everything I had when I was a kid. Oh. And it's all, oh, I was so depressed. <laughs> <laughs> 
but you had a place to put it and channel exactly. It. And yes. I would just write, throw it in a drawer. So if anybody else is out there is going through uh, feeling not wanted, write it down, put it in a drawer. You can make a book later, you know, if you want to show people or like you did, you, you wrote yeah, a join a writing group. Exactly. Yeah. And then when I wrote that, when I wrote that one scene, what did everybody tell me? You should do a one woman play because <laughs> this is one scene. And then I said, all right. And I wrote the whole thing and it became a cathartic, almost like a thesis to my life. And uh -huh. that's what helped me transition into being a therapist. And that's, so now I'm doing both. I still do acting, I do therapy and I love it. I have yeah. the best of both worlds now. I can heal and act and play at the same time. Yeah. And you get to do the acting and playing while you're working as well. Exactly. So that is wonderful. And is there anything more that you would like to share with the audience before we call it a night? I know, right? Well, if you know any families connected by foster care and adoption, especially children, please share my books. What is foster care? What is adoption? Visit my YouTube channel and know that children, we do grow up. However, we don't forget. And we do need that supportive helping hand of an adoption competent therapist guiding us through. And it's not just me, there's, there's now many across the country who have also been in foster care or adoption and are being the difference and making the change necessary so that the next generation doesn't have to suffer as much as we did growing up. There's more understanding of it now too. Yeah, we're not alone anymore. Yeah, because I came from a, a generation that was, well, suck it up because that's life. Oh, oh get over it. Yeah, but oh, that's, yeah. that's the way it was. People had very hard lives. They didn't want to hear about you, you know, talking about yours because they also had it. Because their parents came from the depression era. Yes. And- a lot of immigrants came to the country. You you got to do what you got to do. You don't have time to wallow in your your pity and and you got to work. You got to make a, a name for yourself. I mean, this was, you know, a new frontier. And just remember, just know that we will parent the way we were parented. Yeah. But you can change that. You, you can. can change that. We don't have to parent the way we were parented. And to be attachment focused approach with your child. It's about relationship. The behavior will subside when you focus on the relationship you have with your child and building that trust, love, connection. And just children just need a place to rest their head and talk about their feelings and not feel judged or by their parents. And when they have that emotional blanket to support them, they will get through life. They're not going to be clingy. They're not going to be overly dependent. They're actually going to become more confident, more successful, and more loving. Yeah. That's what we want. When you get them off that high alert emotion. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Thank I you, mean, Sonia. You are so precious. And I'm, I'm like getting emotional now, too. Oh, thank you. Please keep up what you're doing. I think. It's beautiful. Thank you, Sonia. I appreciate that. I've had my uh, up days and my low days, and then I go, just remember why you're doing this. Okay, get, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's a new day. Thank you so much for being on the show. And for any of you people out there, please contact her if you need help or if you know someone that does and become part of that art program. Many blessings. Thank you for listening to the Poetic Resurrection Podcast. Available on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, and many other podcast platforms. Please visit us and subscribe to our newsletter at PoeticResurrection.com for the latest information and updates.